everyone. I'm back again with today's lecture and today's topic is corneal ictasia. Okay, so the term ictasia literally means distension. Okay, so it means distension of a hollow viscous. This ictasia of the cornea can be categorized into two parts. Inflammatory and non-inflammatory. So inflammatory as the word suggests will be secondary to any inflammation. So mostly corneal ulcers are as a complication. The pylomas and keratic tissue developed. Okay. So that will be dealt later. Today mainly I'll be focusing upon non-inflammatory ectasias. Okay. So in non-inflammatory ectasias I'll be talking about keratoconus, keratoglobus and pellucid marginal degeneration. So first I'll be discussing uh, keratoconus. Keratoconus is clinically as well as from your MCQ, MCQ point of view is the most important of all of them. Okay. So I'll start with keratoconus. So what is keratoconus basically? As the word itself suggests that keratoconus, keratoconus, K means, kerato means cornea, okay, and cone means conical cornea. So basically it is a conical cornea. So why does this happen? There is the congenital weakness, okay. So congenitally the cornea is weak. Congenital weakness of cornea will lead to thinning of the stroma and this thinning of the corneal stroma will either be central or paracentral okay so it can be a central or a paracentral thinning due to which there is an apical protrusion of the cornea forming a cone in the cornea okay so a conical protrusion and that is why this keratoconus results. So a conical protrusion of the cornea due to congenital weakness of the cornea is called keratoconus. So what are the characteristics of these keratoconus? First of all, it is a progressive condition. Okay. So as I already told you that it is a congenital weakness but because of its progressive nature it actually manifests during adolescence. Okay. So it becomes symptomatic only during adolescence. Another feature of this is that it is a bilateral condition. So at least in one of the eyes, it is in, it is present in some clinical form. Okay, so a patient comes to you with symptoms in one of the eyes, whereas we find out that the other eye looks absolutely normal to us. But when we do clinical investigations, when we do imaging studies of the other eye, we form a sub we find a subclinical form of keratoconus, and this subclinical form of keratoconus is called form. Thrustic keratoconus. Okay, so form thrustic keratoconus. This is the subclinical form of keratoconus. This is also an MCQ. So form thrustic keratoconus. Now, so when we're talking about keratoconus, how the patient will come to us? So what will be the symptoms of the patient? So obviously, the patient will come to us with the blurring of vision. So why this blurring of vision occurs? So from our previous lectures, we have idea on the refractive errors so we'll be able to say why does the patient have blurring of vision in this case so as i told you that the cornea is going to become conical okay so as a result of this the overall axial length of the eye is going to increase okay so there will be a myopic shift in the refraction so because of myopia the patient will come with blurring of vision and also as we see that the curvature of the cornea is distorted. It is actually becoming parabolic. So because of this astigmatism and myopia, the patient will come with blurring of vision to us. Okay. So blurring of vision because of myopia and astigmatism. Okay. So now because this cone is present, there are certain signs which are present because of this conical protrusion of the cornea, which can be seen either in torch light so what are the torch light signs when we shine a torch on the surface of the cornea so we something uh, we see something which is called the munson sign okay so what is this munson sign so whenever we, we ask the patient to look down now because of this conical protrusion of the cornea when the patient looks down the lower lid is impinged upon by this cone and the lower lid actually looks a little something like this okay because as the patient looks down the cone actually impinges on the lower lid because of which this Munsen sign occurs. Okay. Another torch light sign which occurs is called Rizuti sign. Okay. So Rizuti sign. What is Rizuti sign? So whenever we shine the torch from the temporal side. So because of this cone, the 
light will get displaced beyond the nasal limbus and we can actually make out the conical protrusion of the cornea and that is why this risotti sign. So both of these are, these are MCQs which you can remember Munson sign and risotti sign. Okay, see, so these are the torchlight signs in case of keratoconus. Now when we try to do direct ophthalmoscopy in these patients, so what will happen? There is something which is called an oil droplet reflex. So why does this oil droplet reflex occur? So suppose this is the cornea and this is the conical protrusion which is there inside the cornea. So what will happen that because this one is a cone and has a larger has a larger curvature as well as has a longer axial length in comparison to the rest of the cornea. So the rays which will be entering through, through this part will be converging in nature. Okay. And the rays which will be entering from the periphery will actually be diverging. Okay. So when you actually do direct ophthalmoscopy, you see a concentric shadow. Okay. Which is present, which is concentric to this cone and it is present in the fundus reflex. And because of that, this appears like an oil droplet and that is why it is called an oil droplet reflex. Okay, so oil droplet reflex when you do direct ophthalmoscopy. Now when you try to do retinoscopy in these patients again because of the same reason, both the rays like the rays from the center and the rays from the periphery are actually going to move like hands of a scissors. Okay, so when you do retinoscopy, the reflex is going to move like hands of scissors and that is why there is scissoring of reflexes in case of keratoconus. Okay, scissoring of reflex in retinoscopy. Okay, now I'll come to the slit lamp signs. So whenever you try to see slit lamp of these patients, what you will find is there is something called warped stri. Okay, warped stri. So what are these warped stri? So, stri definitely means lines. So, when you try to see the cornea of these patients, when you make a slit, you will see some fine stress lines. Okay, vertical fine stress lines. And when you apply a little bit pressure, these lines are going to disappear. And they are very characteristic of keratoconus. Okay, so walk stri are some lines of stress in the stroma of the cornea. Another slit lamp sign which you are going to see is, there are enlarged corneal nerves. Okay enlarged corneal nerves. So this is one of the slit lamp signs. Another sign which you are going to see is something which is also an MCQ again is called a flasher's ring. Okay. So what is this flasher's ring? So as we know that there is a conical protrusion of the cornea and keratoconus. So the tear surface on this cornea is not very uniform. So because of that, the iron is getting deposited at the base of this cone. This iron is mainly in form of hemosiderin. Okay. And this will appear as a ring which is present at the base of the cornea. So that is why it's called a uh, flasher's ring. And you can very well appreciate it with uh, in cobalt filter. Okay. When you see with cobalt blue filter, you can actually appreciate this flasher's ring. Okay, so these are the signs which you get in keratoconus and all of these signs are your MCQs. Okay, so you must remember them. So these are the signs in keratoconus. Now, so how will you go about investigating these cases of keratoconus? So, as I told you, you can do slit lamp and you can do all those things. But when it comes to imaging studies, what you can do is, the first thing you can do is something which is called a placido ring. Okay. So, I'll also take the opportunity to explain a little bit about these things which might come as separate MCQs altogether. So, what is a placido ring? So, this is a very simple uh, circular, circular disc which consists of black and white circles, concentric circles. And there is a hole in the center through which the observer can look at the reflex on the cornea. So, as we know that the anterior surface of the cornea actually acts as a convex mirror. Okay. So, in a mirror, whenever some image is formed, we can actually visualize it. So, what happens that we keep a placido ring in front of the patient and we look through the circular hole in the center and there is a light which is shining behind this placido ring behind the observer. So when the patient sees a shadow of these rings are formed on the anterior surface of the cornea 
and because these these lines which are actually going to project on the surface of the cornea forming an image if there's a keratoconus these lines will actually become distorted okay so even in early cases of keratoconus these placido placido ring lines are going to be distorted these concentric circles are not going to appear uniform the lines will become distorted so this is the placido ring which you can do another thing which you can do is called keratometry okay so when you try to do keratometry first of all i tell you what keratometry is this keratometry is keratometer is also called an ophthalmometer okay ophthalmometer so what happens in this this basically is used to measure the curvature of the cornea so curvature of the anterior surface of the cornea okay and one more important thing to remember about this keratometry is that it measures the cur uh, curvature of the cornea only in the central 3 mm okay only in the central 3 mm so whenever a conical protrusion is there from our understanding we can know that the curvature will definitely be steep so when you do a keratometry you will find a steep curvature so on the basis of this the keratoconus can actually be categorized into mild moderate and severe so a mild keratoconus will be something which has the curvature approximately of more than 48 diopters okay so a mild will be something which is more than uh, which is more than 48 diopters a moderate will be something which is from 48 to 54 and something above 54 will be your a uh, severe okay so this is how according to keratometry you can categorize keratoconus depending on the curvature of the cornea now as i already told you that the shortcoming of this keratometry is that it can measure the curvature of the cornea only in the central 3 mm so if you want to visualize a large part of the cornea or you if you want to visualize the curvature of the entire cornea you need some other investigation or a device so that can be done by something which is called a topography okay you can do topography now in this topography what happens is that the cornea you like there are thousands of points which are analyzed and a computer based program is constructed okay so you can measure curvature of the cornea at different points and a color coded map is created okay color coded map is created depending upon the steepness of the cornea the thickness of the cornea the thinness of the cornea color coded maps are created so what happens in this keratoconus you know there's a there's a perception that basically you can see because of the astigmatism you can see different kinds of structures in this topography so the first thing when you know it's not very severe in early stages you can actually see a symmetric bow tie appearance in a topography symmetric bow tie okay when the keratoconus progresses from the symmetric bow tie it will go on to be an asymmetric bow tie okay an asymmetric bow tie and finally when it progresses more there will be a steep cone which is formed in the infero nasal quadrant of the cornea okay so i'll be talking to you in detail about what this topography is and how does it look like in my later lectures but for now just know that these are the findings which you, which you get in case of keratoconus as it progresses from an early to a late stage okay so these are certain investigations which you can do to find out keratoconus Okay. Now, why does this keratoconus occur? So, what is the etiopathogenesis behind it? So, this is still like these are still hypotheses which haven't been confirmed. So, before that, I'll tell you that this is an autosomal dominant condition, okay, with variable penetrance. It's an autosomal dominant condition with variable penetrance. Okay. So, it has been hypothesized that there is some problem with the lysosomal enzymes in the epithelium of the cornea so these lysosomal enzymes actually increase and there is a decrease in the protease inhibitors proteinase inhibitors in the cornea and that is why there is this weakness of the cornea and also it has been hypothesized that it's a connective tissue disorder because of it because of its association with certain connective tissue disorders like marfan syndrome okay like osteogenesis imperfecta 
एहलर डैंडो सिंड्रोम ओके सो बिकॉज ऑफ द एसोसिएशन ऑफ कैरेटिकोनस विद दीज कनेक्टिव टिश्यू डिसऑर्डर इट हैज बीन थॉट टू बी अ कनेक्टिव टिश्यू डिसऑर्डर इज वेल ओके now there are certain ocular conditions also which are associated with this keratoconus now those conditions are really important because they might come as mcqs uh, so what are the ocular conditions which are associated with keratoconus the first one is vernal keratoconjunctivitis so vkc blue sclera okay aniridia lebers congenital amyrosis are certain ocular conditions which are also associated with keratoconus and another important thing is that it is also associated with down syndrome okay so there's a striking coincidence between uh, down syndrome and keratoconus so these are all mcqs which you must remember now as i already told you that this is a congenital condition and there's a weakness of the cornea and this results in thinning of the stroma and parastroma so as this condition progresses and if it goes untreated what happens is that the desmet membrane sometimes get gets breached because of the increased thinning of the cornea and when this gets breached the aqueous actually enters into the substance of the cornea okay and the patient comes with severe pain photophobia and blurring of vision and this condition is called acute hydrops okay so acute hydrops so basically the in this condition the patient is symptomatically managed and the main line of treatment is hyperosmolar agents okay like hyperosmolar agents like sodium chloride solutions are used in case of acute hydrops apart from the symptomatic management you are doing for this patient and sometimes what happens in this acute hydrops is that because there is actually a rupture of the desmet membranes sometimes this cone becomes steep and after this episode subsides the patient actually has a better vision because of the uh, like the curvature becomes flattened and also because it is easier now to fit contact lenses to these patients so sometimes after acute hydrops the patient has a better vision and this always heals with the scarring okay so this is the complication of an untreated keratoconus now how do you go about treating this keratoconus so when this keratoconus is present in early stages you can try spectacles okay you can try spectacles or you can use soft contact lenses okay in early stages only when the keratoconus progresses you can try using rigid contact lenses okay another promising thing which has been which is also very important from mcq point of view is something which is called collagen cross linking okay so cxr or collagen cross linking so what basically this this method is actually this method actually uses 0.1% riboflavin okay so why this uh, 0.1% riboflavin is used it actually photosensitizes cornea okay so it will make cornea photosensitive to what uva radiation okay so the cornea because of riboflavin is going to become photosensitive to uv radiation so how is this done so this 0.1% riboflavin is instilled into the cornea every 3 minutes for a period of 30 minutes okay and after doing this the uva at a rate of 3 microwatt per centimeter square is given and how does this act so basically it is going to strengthen the cornea okay so how this collagen cross linking is going to strengthen the cornea so it is going to form some covalent bonds okay between the fibrils of collagen some intra as well as well as interfibrillar bonds between the fibrils of collagen and this is going to strengthen the cornea so this collagen cross linking this is a very important mcq so you use 0.1% riboflavin 
every 3 minutes for a period of 30 minutes and then you are going to expose the cornea to UVA radiation at a rate of 3 microwatts per centimeter square. Now another definite treatment of this keratoconus is going to be a penetrating keratoplasty. So you can, uh, you can do penetrating keratoplasty and as you must remember from my last lecture I told you about DALG. Okay. So DALG is a very suitable procedure in this, kind of, is in this condition in case of keratoconus. So I will just tell you that this uh, DALG is basically deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So what you are going to do, you are going to remove the stroma till you reach the desmond membrane and you are going to do the keratoplasty. So if you want to know about DALG in detail, you can go back to my previous lecture. So, DALG is a suitable procedure, but you must also remember that you cannot do DALG if acute hydrops has happened. Okay, so why you cannot do? As I already told you that this is a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty and in acute hydrops your desmond membrane is going to get breached. So, if you do not have a good desmond membrane, you cannot go for DALG. So, DALG should not be done if acute hydrops has already happened. And another very, very important thing about this keratoconus is that all the refractive surgeries are contraindicated. Okay. You cannot go for LASIK in these patients. Another very important thing about, another important modality of treatment about this keratoconus is that you can implant intrastromal ring segments. Okay. Ring segments in these patients of keratoconus. So that is all about keratoconus. Now I also told you that I'll tell you about pellucid margin and regeneration and keratoglobus. So I'll first talk about pellucid margin and regeneration. So this is also an ectatic condition of the cornea. So what is this PMD? So as I told you this is a marginal degeneration, ectatic condition. So in the periphery from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock position. Okay, from in the periphery of the cornea, from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock position, there is going to be a thinning of the stroma. Okay, and one important thing is that this thinning is located approximately 1 millimeter away from the limbus. And this ring is approximately 1 to 2 millimeters in size. Okay, so there will be a crescentic thinning of the cornea in the periphery and this is going to manifest only in adulthood. Okay. This is going to manifest in adulthood. So again the patient is going to come to you with blurring of vision because of astigmatism. And another important thing over here to remember also for an MCQ is that the astigmatism in this PMD is against the rule. Okay, against the rule astigmatism. Must remember pellucid marginal degeneration. Now when again you do topography for these patients, you are going to uh, find a butterfly configuration. Okay, a butterfly configuration. Also an MCQ again. Now, how do you go about treating this PMD? So again, you can use spectacles, contact lenses if it suits the patient. And again, definitive treatment is keratoplasty. Here, you can actually go for a large eccentric graft, okay. You can use, you do not use the whole cornea, but you use a large eccentric graft. You can do this and collagen cross-linking is also a promising treatment in case of PMD also. So, this is all about PMD. Now, my last topic for today, that is keratoglobus. Now, what is this keratoglobus? It is a very, very rare condition. Okay, this keratoglobus. And as the name suggests, the cornea, the entire cornea actually becomes globular. So, it becomes like a hemisphere. Okay, this is also, this is present from birth also because of congenital weakness of the cornea. The entire cornea is going to become hemispherical. Again, the patient is going to have a large amount of, a lot of blurring of vision because of the hemispherical shape of the cornea. And when you do topography, you will actually find a uniform thinning of the cornea. So throughout the surface of the cornea, you find that the uh, stroma is thinned out. And when you want to do topography, again, you will find this, this steep curvature all through the cornea. So this is all about keratoconus. It's a very rare chance that you will get a question on keratoglobus. And also on PMD, the main thing about this lecture is keratoconus. 
and there are lots of MCQs in Keratoconus. So you must study it with caution. In my next uh, classes, I'll be talking to you about staphylomas and some miscellaneous topics in cornea. That's all for today. Thank you.